Two words can change your life. I do. You're fired. It's malignant. Or for us Central Florida people, four rivers. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. There's two other words, simple, rather mundane, and very common, that when used together can also change your life and change the world. These two words, yes and. Yes and. Yes for I'm listening, I'm suspending judgment, and and for I will add to it and help move forward. For example, when Rosa got on the bus, she said, I can ride this bus and sit in the front. When the computer whiz and his friend said, let's build an open source encyclopedia and make it free for the whole world. And JFK said, let's take a man to the moon and bring him back. Now, not all ideas should or could be as big as the ones I just mentioned. But I would like to propose that every idea deserves at least one minute of life. That's kind of radical, I know. There's a lot of bad ideas. In fact, I even Googled bad ideas. And there were 716 million entries that came up. So, so uh, I uh, took a moment and perused through a few of them. And I just randomly picked three. A cement parachute. <laughs> and, uh, a glass hammer, and an invisible TV. So yes, sounds like pretty bad ideas. Well, I said, all right, I'm going to apply the yes and theory, and I'm going to study these out a little. So it turns out that yes, a cement parachute is a bad idea if you're jumping from a plane and want to live. But if you're a, a band in Scotland looking for a name, the cement parachutes might be a pretty good idea. Or if uh, a contractors, I doubt, would use glass hammers. But if you're a woman working in technology and you just broke through the glass ceiling and you were nominated to win the glass hammer award, that'd be pretty good. And invisible TVs, have you seen them? Well, maybe not. <laughs> they're, they're 72 inches long and one fourth inch wide. So from the side, you can't see them. Yes and changes our perspectives. Psychologists tell us that we, ha we have all been conditioned to say no. In fact, the older we get, the more we say no. And there is a theory that we have a yes-no ratio in our life. Some um, more than others, I guess, because everybody would say, uh, would say yes once to maybe four no's or a yes to 119 no's. It just sort of depends on your situation. But the key is, is to be mindful of what your ratio is, because we all have a yes-no ratio. Because it turns out that it doesn't really matter if an idea is good or bad. If it's new and different, we will say no to it. And because new and different ideas scare us, take us off kilter, and confuse us. And an off-kilter, confused, scared mind says no. So I would like to add something to the great statement that Victor Hugo said, that an army of men cannot stop an idea whose time has come. I would like to add, but we certainly try. <laughs> and because we're so used to saying no, we don't even realize we're saying no sometimes. For example, when my boys want to go to a movie, I might say, don't waste your money, that's not a very good movie. Or maybe they're dating somebody. Don't go out with her, she's a loser. I think I'm only out of love. I'm saying it only out of love. Or, or if they're looking at a certain major in university, I might say, don't take this major, you'll never get a job. Now, I say that out of worry. But we just are blind sometimes to our no's. But when we do know we're saying no, we actually like to blame it on someone else or do other things, like for example, the devil. <laughs> May, let me be the devil's advocate. And who wants to argue with the devil? I don't. Or we become historians. 
didn't we try that five years ago and it was a bad idea then? Or we just simply trifle with people's emotions. And we say, hey, that's a great idea, but it'll never work. And we oftentimes roll our propensity to say no into our environments, and we become uh, confounded by the environment that we feel like we have to say no. I've had people say, say to me, I can't serve wasabi peas in my house, my kids don't like them. Or, we can't be creative here, we're too busy making money. Or, our boss doesn't want any new ideas, we already have our five-year strategic plan. Or on a personal note, I'm too old, no one listens to me. I'm too young, no one listens to me. I'm too fat, no one takes me seriously. Or, now this hasn't been my particular problem, I'm too thin, no one takes me seriously. Well, I work in an environment that's very restrictive. One mistake could result in lawsuit, firing, or death. I work in a hospital. And about a year ago, we decided to open up an innovation lab, the Florida Hospital Innovation Lab. And the CEO, David Banks, invited everybody, all the employees, to come and participate. Ideas from everywhere, voices from everyone. And we built the lab on the idea of everybody has creative capacity and leadership potential. And we had three goals. To create better solutions for healthcare, to develop innovative and design thinkers, and to help build a culture of innovation. So when word got out, people started coming, and we noticed three categories of people. People who thought they had no ideas, people who thought they had all the ideas, <laughs> and people who would shoot down the ideas. And so we realized that even though we had a really powerful innovation process, we would get nowhere without a yes and mentality. So we had to build a bridge of yes and, and start teaching basic, simple, improv games to people that were based in yes and, that really that gave them the, exa the example of what yes and really means. And we found that it worked. We have over 50 projects in the lab now, and we've taught more than 800 people the concept of yes and. And we did a survey last month, and we found that 90, 3% of the people that had been in the lab said they would come back and they would recommend people to come and bring their challenges there. And we were pretty excited about that. Now, I'm curious, how many improv artists do we have here today? A few. Well, how many of us today are interested in being innovative, creative, or help create solutions for a better future? How many? Okay, good, all of us. Well, so, but there's a discrepancy, did you notice? A few improv artists, but all the rest of us are interested in being innovative. We found the same thing in the lab. People were interested, but they didn't think they could. Well, it turns out that improv and innovation are the same. And you might say, wait a minute, improv is about comedy and jazz, and innovation is about creating cell phones and bladeless fans. <laughs> but in, in, reality, in reality, improv is not about comedy at its core, and improv is not about, or innovation is not about inventions at its core. Both of them are about two words, yes and, and the open space for us to move past our habitual ways of thinking and acting. And it gives you a tool that you can actually let your own true creativity be seen by the world. You can give your, a gift to the world. And if you don't give your gift to the world, nobody will. And the world will be lost forever to your gift. And yes, and is the way for you to roll it out. Now, The Economist told us about six years ago that creativity and innovation were our best resources for this century. The Harvard Business Review has had an article on innovation and creativity in almost every, every issue for the last 10 years. And Google, if you Google innovation, you'll get 415 million hits. Not as much as bad ideas, but <laughs> it's sort of interesting. 
but it, there's a lot. And the really cool thing is yes and is easy to do, believe it or not. All you have to do, there's no new words you have to learn, yes and, we all know that, in any language. It's free and it just takes two seconds of courage. And when you say yes and to something, you immediately unite a community. You build bonds. You suspend judgment. You are in the now. You ignite the strengths of the group or the strengths within the group. And you also are able to embrace failure and learn from what the failure or see it as an opportunity. Now, I first encountered yes and in a very real way when I was in the fourth grade. And I was a really bad student. And I, when I, um, first, second, third, I looked to the fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Eskew, and I could not wait to be in the fourth grade because I thought she was so cool. Even though she was about 120 years old, I reckoned. And when she would take her students out for recess, she would sit on the, the bench and fall asleep. And they would, her kids had recess like three times longer. And when they went back in, when they went back in to class, she would let one of the better readers in the class read, and she'd sit at her, front, her, her desk and fall asleep. And they could read the whole afternoon, so I could not wait to be in the fourth grade. So imagine my dismay when I walked in the first day of fourth grade, and Mrs. Eskew was not there, but a lady with very skinny legs, red hair, and a wrinkly neck. I was staring at her neck when she <laughs> said, class, hello. My name is Mrs. Roster, and she turned and wrote it on the board. Well, it might have been my fourth grade wisdom or my frustration that Mrs. Eskew wasn't there, but I said to her, I was sitting right in the front row, you really ought to go by Mrs. Rooster since you look like one. <laughs> and so I, I was a bad student. Well, so she turned around just like that. And she said, yes, and they have a dance, the chicken dance. And she taught it. She said, stand up, we're going to learn it. And she taught it to us. I remember it still. Beaks, wings, tail feathers, and four claps. Maybe you know the chicken dance. Well, a little later, a few weeks later, Ronnie Antone, one of the boys in our class, had to go to the bathroom. And you know the little bathroom's in the back. <clears throat> he went uh, back. Somebody was in there. And so he went up to the front of the room to ask Mrs. Roster if he could use the girls' bathroom. But it was uh, too late. He peed his pants right there on the floor. And so, oh, we thought that was hilarious. And so um, Mrs. Roster jumps up and she's, she drops some paper towel, grabs some paper towels, drops it in the puddle of pee, and begins wiping her feet. And she says, come on, class, everybody get some paper towels. We're going to learn how to paper towel ski up and down the classroom. And so we did, she did, up and down the whole aisles, and then she even thanked Ronnie Antone when we were done. She thanked him for the experience. <laughs> well, a little later in the year, she said, we're going to be doing, doing oral reports, and she assigned topics, and she assigned me eagles. So time went on, and one morning she said, today's the day we're giving our oral reports, after lunch. And so, I listened to her say that. I thought, okay, I have not done one thing <laughs> to prepare. And I started to be filled with dread because I thought my life's going to end after lunch. <laughs> and I just sat and watched the clock tick by. And I became more and more filled with dread, panic, lunch came. I asked Mrs. Esty if I could come in a little early, and I got out my little handwriting paper, you know, that brown paper with the blue lines, and I wrote three sentences. And then I waited. The class came in, Mrs. E Roster stood up, and she said, okay, well, start the reports. She seemed pretty excited. And I was just paralyzed with fear. And people started giving theirs, and finally she called me, Karen, we'll now hear about eagles. So I stood up and I knew she could not see my pounding heart or the tears at the edge of my eyes that I was about to shed. And I went to the front of the class and I just stood there. And she said, okay, Karen, you can give the report. So I said, 
Eagles are birds, eagles build nests, eagles can fly. And I, I knew my classmates were just going to break into gales of laughter. But she stood up and she said, class, Karen has just given us three characteristics of eagles. I'm going to write them on the board, let's fill it in. And she says, come up, if you know something, let's fill it in. If you want to draw something, you can draw. I went back to my chair, and the love I felt for Mrs. Roster could have spread around the world. And the debt of gratitude I owed her, I, I knew could only be repaid by becoming a better student. Mrs. Roster embodied yes and, and she inspired the creativity and the potential of my whole class. We're all Mrs. Rosters. Every one of us in here is a Mrs. Roster. And if you don't believe me, if you did one of three things today, it's proof. If you walked in here on your own accord, if you carried on a conversation with somebody, or you drove today, yesterday, I mean you drove safely, that is. <laughs> we can't always assume. And because there was a day when you couldn't even say yes and, and you learned not only yes and, but you're speaking fluently. And there was a day you laid in your crib with your feet flying over your head, but you're walking, and you're running, skipping. And there was a day that you didn't know how to drive, and your parent, a neighbor, a teacher, yes and you to competency on the road. Or we, we hope so. <laughs> that is yes and, and that's the power of yes and. I just finished a five-year study in creativity and innovation, which included a 250-page dissertation that I survived through. And with, as I got done with it, I looked back, and all of that could be boiled down to two words. You probably know what I'm going to say. Yes, and. So I could have written a shorter dissertation. <laughs> but I don't, think my, I, don't, I don't think my advisor would have liked it. So we are all improv artists. We are all creative. We're all innovative. So I'd like to encourage and invite every one of you, before you leave tonight, to say yes and to something that you might not have otherwise. Start a yes and revolution in your life, because your ideas deserve one minute of life. Ignite the inspiration, the creativity, and the potential in your life and the life of others by two small words. Yes, and.